My name is Jamil Kasako. I'm the Director of Education and Engagement Programs here at New York Live Arts, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our Stay Late Conversation. This evening we have the pleasure of welcoming Mr. Thomas Lax, Associate Curator at MoMA. Uh, he'll be in conversation with uh, Robert Glasper and Kyle Abraham and the beautiful company of uh, amazing dancers. So without any further ado, I invite Kyle and Thomas onto the stage. And Jamila, is it just the two of us or are we waiting for everybody else? Well, you can start. And okay, then so the I guess the dancers, of course, are oh, changing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they'll join us in yeah. a second. Um, so thank you all for staying. Thank you to New York Live Arts for inviting me back here. Um, it's super special to be sitting here with you, Kyle, because we actually met here um, when we were in dance theater workshop um, several years ago. 2008. 2008, exactly. And I think at the time we began our relationship, I wrote a piece for you for the Studio Museum where I used to be a curator. So it feels perfectly fitting that we are here again tonight um, for what is a momentous occasion, the end of your two-year residency and the premiere of four new works, which is quite incredible to think about. So congratulations. <laughs> so we have the advantage of sitting here with one of your collaborators. Um, but I think it offers us a great opportunity to talk a little bit about how collaborative this process was. The set that we see behind us was designed by the artist Glenn Ligon, um, who <clears throat> in the world of the Studio Museum is a kind of legend, an icon. Um, and of course you worked with Dan Scully um, on the lighting design, which you've now done for the last 10 years. Ten years. So that's kind of you know, another fantastic ongoing relationship. Can you talk a little bit about each of those components, the video projection, the lighting design, the costumes, the set, how you worked with each of these incredible collaborators and creative um, agents differently to make this work? Uh, sure, I think with each, each uh, collaborator it was a different process in some ways, but... Uh, <laughs> come on out, Robert. Yeah. <laughs> Robert Glass, everybody. It was, a, it was a different process with each collaborator, really, uh, dancers included. Um, a lot of this project started about two years ago, a little over two years ago, before um, we actually started the residency here, um, doing some research and whatnot. Um, but really, I think with everyone, it's a lot of it was conversation, so talking to them about what uh, my thoughts were about the subject matter and approaching the, um, the original Max Roach music and thinking how we wanted to kind of um, reinterpret that in some way and re-envision it for four different works that hopefully wouldn't look similar. And can you give us a sense, since Glenn is not here this evening, of the set? You know, just talk about what prompts you gave to him, what you asked him for, what are we looking at, why are we looking at it? Sure, the crazy thing was, uh, Glenn was, he came into rehearsal a good deal. A lot of the times uh, I would play a song and then Glenn would comment on the history of the song or talk about when he was first hearing that music, and then that brought up other things for me in terms of the creative process. In terms of this set and the other scenic look uh, for the watershed, uh, we actually weren't sure for a while which set was going to go with which work. Uh, I think some of it actually had to do with, with the band, actually, um, because the other set, um, if you see that work, has a big tree on stage, and it would have probably, it would have been a bit overwhelming to have um, instruments, the tree, X, Y, and Z. So we, we decided at one point to kind of think about how we can manipulate the space to um, serve the work in, in both projects. Um, but a lot of it was a lot of back and forth, really, in terms of the texture of the wood that he uses in the set for the other show. Um, this backdrop uh, was actually inspired by a book that I, ga oh, a book that, uh, I gave to Glenn. Oh, it was a book. Uh, Freedom, it's this uh, book of um, photography. Um, Edited by Manning Marable? I think so, yeah. Uh, so we played with that for a little bit and brought that in. It's actually backstage. The dancers use it to kind of uh, get into uh, the zone for some of the works in the first half of this program in particular. 
So maybe that's a great segue for all of the fantastic dancers and let's give them another round of applause. And why don't we, starting on this end, just introduce yourself, just say your name. Hi, my name is Penda Jai. I'm Jordan Morley. Tamisha Guy. Hi, I'm Matthew Baker. Karen Young, costume designer. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Neal. <laughs> Winston Dynamite Brown. Catherine Kirk. Connie Shaw. So I want to get into a question about history. Um, and maybe I'll start with you first, Karen. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that's really remarkable to me about both evenings of work, and if you guys haven't seen the other evening, you can come back tomorrow night and you can see it, um, is how resonant the costumes are with history and that both of the programs, you know, the one that we saw tonight kind of begins in a, you know, French courtly situation and kind of moves up to what I see as the 1950s, that's at least how I see it. And then in the, you know, in the other program, The Watershed, um, there's a similar move historically, both from kind of civil rights, pre-civil rights era, to something that looks quite futuristic. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how you came to design the looks um, of the costumes and what that's meant to convey to the audience? Yeah, I mean, Reed Bartelme did the first two, the first half this evening, so I don't know if he was thinking courtly for that, <laughs> but but you never know. But um, for the other, all the other costumes, I was definitely doing a lot of historical research to, to try to find a way to sometimes evoke that. I mean, with the Getton, it was the shapes were pretty much right out of the 50s or late 50s, but um, how how I could kind of com combine all of the images that Kyle was referring to whether it was contemporary or period or South Africa or street or more in the future. I was just always kind of looking at all of that and finding a way to put it all together. And one aspect of the work, it's so beautifully layered, um, but one through line is this idea of how I understand it, of kind of diaspora or movement um, or shared experience really in the most kind of fundamental of ways. And so even as you're describing the role of Africa, I guess the last part is called All Africa, is that? So in the, one of the sections in um, the Getten. The, the first section in the Getten is uh, All Africa. So in that passage, there is this direct engagement with that material, but especially in the musical composition, by the fantastic Robert Glasper to my right. There's <laughs> there's a real sense of uh, using kind of stage presence and um, you know the the kind of instrumentation towards evoking a, another place. And I think that as you were describing how all of you so beautifully move around the space, we feel like we're transported to another kind of location. Can you talk about um, how on earth you did that for us? We just tapped into us. I mean, rhythm, Africa, African rhythms. These are African rhythms. And everything that we do now in the music that we play, even the most modern type of music, is all, all stems from African music. So, you know, it just, it was natural for us. Otis Brown, the drummer, give him a round of applause. I mean, <laughs> There's a record out right now on Blue Note Records called The Thought of You. Pick it up now on iTunes. Um, shameless plug. And <laughs> shameless plug. Yeah, and Vicente Archer, the bass player, and um, Charnay, yes. The... <laughs> Charnay Wade, the vocalist. <laughs> Actually, she was lip singing, I was singing everything, so. But uh, no, basically, yeah, we just tapped into that. It's, it's, it was fairly easy when you, when, when once we knew what the vibe was, and we were all very much aware, and and we already knew the We Insist record. You know what I mean? So when it was like time for these parts, this it was just like, oh, cool, we're just there. So it was really no thought. It was all right, we're there now, and it's all of a part of us. So it wasn't a far journey at all. It was just like, oh, okay, cool, you know, easy. <laughs> for you. <laughs> What, was, what were some of the prompts and the instructions, suggestions that Kyle gave to you that brought that out? 
Well, since I choreographed the dance as well, <laughs> it was easy for me. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, no, it was, this was different for me because I've never worked with a dance company before on my own, like, you know, me and, the, and, and, and an instructor, like, doing stuff. Like, I played in a band with, you know, but this is my first time actually creating. So it was interesting because I've never had, to, normally when I've done things of this nature, I like, you know, they like, hey, I need some music for something, and then they make a dance to my music, you know. That's what I'm used to. But here, it was like, I had to watch what he was doing and actually come up with something. And then he would hear something we're doing on the spot to be like, oh, stop right there. You know what, yeah, let's do something right there. So then he'll make up a, you know, make up a whole thing I know the whole, I'm not gonna dance for you now, but I know it. Um, you know, he'll make up something on the spot, you know what I mean? So it was like, for a, it was, we're a jazz band, but he was jazz and they're jazz because they were on the spot like, all right, cool, so what you wanna do? Boom, 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 bam, and then it was just, it was easy, you know what I'm saying, so we worked together. So it was, it was very, it was very much like we're on the bandstand and how we do as jazz musicians, we're on the fly, like, oh, what do you want, all right, cool, and everything's at the last minute you know, seeing what somebody's doing and going with it. And that's how Kyle and the rest of the dancers are. They get it really quickly and Kyle's like, hey, when she puts her arm up, give me a cymbal swell. And all this is like, cool, you know. And then, you know, so it's just like working together, it's cool. I think as an audience member, you totally feel that synergy between all of you. Is it a similar process choreographically? Is there like a kind of back and forth that same way with you guys as the makers of this work? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Kyle's a very collaborative choreographer, um, and in different different kinds of way, you know, uh, sometimes we might come in the studio and be working on a phrase that he's just taught to us or, or something like that, but, but there could be infinite amounts of times that it could change or adjust based on what he's seeing or how it's, um, that movement is speaking in the context of the greater work. So, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's, I think it's very similar to a sort of jazz improvisation type collaboration where you have to be open to um, communicating back and forth. And if you're not listening, then the collaboration stops. So I think Kyle's a great listener and we all strive to be putting forth our, anything we can do to help, so. And just to be clear, is that in rehearsal or is that on the stage in terms of that kind of process of intuition and watching the other folks that you're moving with? Oh, well, it's definitely both. You know, that, that process happens in rehearsal between the dancers and Kyle, and it happens much more between the dancers ourselves on stage. You know, somebody might be feeling it and really hitting that step, and they're just off to the races, and you better be ready to go. So. Same thing with us as a musician too, because we never play the same thing. Each night is something different. Like, so when we're watching the dancers, none of the sections we've ever played have been the same, exactly. That's why we don't have music up there or anything. You know what I mean? So we're literally watching the dancers and getting the vibe from them and coming up with something as we, as we go, watching them, you know what I mean? So I think that helps the whole thing. That's, you know, and y'all are feeling what we're doing, you know, especially me, because everything I'm doing is amazing. <laughs> Oh, um, no, I'm joking. But no, you know, so it was back, it was the whole together. It was great. So, Kyle, I want to ask you a tough question. And, and, you know, now that we've known each other since we won't, well, you already said it, but we won't remind everybody how long we've known each other. Um, your earlier work, in some ways, was deeply personal, um, in that. You know, first of all, whenever I would go see your performances, there'd be a bus of people who would come from Pittsburgh. Anybody, anybody here tonight from Pittsburgh? They're coming tomorrow. They're coming tomorrow. They're, co they're, coming, they're coming on Saturday, Saturday for the party. Yeah. So all I have to say is watch out, because it would be amazing that people would drive, you know, 10 hours, and then so eager to see what you had done. And in many ways, not only because you were a local star, but because your work had treated a place that you're from and put it into a larger context. Um, and this work, of course, comes from that similar sense of your own self, but it really deals with material that in many ways is about our generation's legacy. How do you think about the civil rights era um, and the many promises that were made, and some of which 
we've been granted, but of course many of which have not. Um, and I think that grappling with the failure and the kind of ongoingness of that is in many ways what structures your work. Um, these, these four works that we've seen in the last couple of nights, how, how as a maker, as somebody who's embedded in the communities that you work in, do you go about approaching this grand thing of history? I think I'm still trying to grapple with that in some ways, um, as some of the reviews will say. Um, I think uh, part of that is, hey, it's all good. Uh, part of it is that um, I think, especially when you look at a work like Hallowed, it's really um, a work that I'm thinking about my life growing up in Pittsburgh and, and all those kind of labels that uh, someone might define me as, as a black gay man from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and it's interesting being born in the 70s and um, just thinking about experiences of you know being in elementary school and having someone be my friend one day and the next day they can spit on me and call me the N-word, but it's a word that I don't know if today the same situations are happening, not that I would want them to in any way, shape, or form, but it's a different thing, but it's a part of who I am and that's what shapes that work in particular and, and shapes the work. Um, a lot of it, beca because it's coming from my body, it's coming from my experiences, and, and that's what's shaping my own personal history, which is a reflection of history uh, at large. Um, I think um, we, hopefully, I think we talk a good deal about the work when we're making it, about each, each person's experience, but a lot of it, um, when I tell the dancers, you know, let's, let's approach this with, this actually should be anger, but it should be a, a unified anger, and part of that is coming from my frustrations that I'm seeing today based on things that I was dealing with 20, 30 years ago. Are there any other approaches, since you guys are the one carrying out that anger? <laughs> How do you feel that? How do you, how do you translate that weight of history into what you do? Do you, do you care about it? Is it something that's important? I don't care. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, I do, I definitely care. I think for me, it's a, it's a lot of, I try in my personal life to, to not let, let the idea of racism or just the issues that have gone on in the past kind of cater to how I live my life. I kind of try to be open in, to everything. But with that in mind, I take in perspective like Kyle's experiences and my, my parents' experiences. My father is from the South, he's from North Carolina, my mother is from Detroit, and they both, growing up, have sp spoken to me a lot about you know my mom's living through the Detroit riots and my dad coming up and witnessing sit-ins while he was in, in school and trying to go to college and get an education. And I think all of that comes into my mind when I approach the work, and especially like Kyle says, he has his book that we look at backstage and it's kind of, it's crazy because some of these pictures are like near where my mother was living or near where my father was living. So it's just like kind of putting myself in their place and, and, and thinking about what they would be saying or what they would be doing and how they would be acting in this situation and, con and also taking in, in consideration what I would do if I was there then and what I would be doing now, what I am doing now. Heavy. There's also a, dis a, a difference in, you know, even the 10 years that of, between myself and, and Jeremy and some of these other dancers, the amount of uh, freedoms that live in their body is so different from what my experience is. Um, and it's been really interesting to see and just witness when, I, when, I'm, when I'm around them, even just, you know, joking with Jeremy at the airport wearing some short shorts, and I'm like, there's no way in hell I would feel comfortable doing that right, you know, but that's partially because of, you know, the way the, my environment, you know, hey, you don't want it, you feeling good, but it's, it's so different. It's just, it's such a different experience. Um, and I, I just, I don't feel that same freedom just in the 10 years that separates, separates us. And I think we should also remember where we are. You know, this is now the home of the Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Dance Company. And in a lot of ways, you can trace the legacy and ability and freedom that you've had to make work through his own, you know, their careers and the kind of ongoingness of the work that they've um, given to us as viewers. You also very prestigiously are at the end of a two year residency here and just so people know if they wanna get a residency here, like what you've actually gotten while you've been here, can you just share a little bit about what's happened over the last two years? Sure, it was on salary, uh, I had studio space. Um, yeah, exactly, healthcare is good. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, the development team, they've, they've been really amazing, actually. Um, really, really supportive. Um, 
Yeah, I got a little choked up. Uh, they, they've been really supportive. It, I think it's the, administratively, in particular, the, the, there's just been a really um, great of, group of people there to constantly give us um, knowledge and give me knowledge on how to sustain a company and to help even my administrative team out in different ways. So that's been really, really, really wonderful. Um, yeah, I guess that's my ultimate highlight, really, uh, through, throughout this residency. And even just um, the more interactions I've had with both Bill and Carla when she was here. Um, yeah, Carla Peterson, who I love. Uh, so it's just been it's, been, it's been really wonderful having that kind of rapport and exchange with them. So, of course, you know, what, something that's amazing to watch is how you all interpret Kyle's movement. There's something so particular about the way that you articulate your body. Um, and there's one moment in the watershed where we get to see you move. Um, and for me, it brought back that character from inventing Pookie Jenkins. In a way, it's like she's back, but in some kind of other form. Can you just talk about, you know, when you appear in your work, when you don't appear in your work, what that character is for those of us who've seen the other work? Uh, sure, yeah, it's different. I think at some point I might be in this program, just not yet. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, the, the work that uh, Thomas is referring to is Inventing Pookie Jenkins, a solo that I, uh, I choreographed in 2006 and performed a good deal. Um, but it's really kind of looking at identity um, and what what my experience predominantly was in like high school years in particular, thinking about walking down the hallways and think trying to walk a certain way that's not really me or trying to change the way I, I speak to kind of fit in really or go unnoticed. Um, and I think in in the watershed there is a play with confidence a little bit and just how um, my body might kind of react at times and kind of strike certain poses. Um, but it's I think there's this kind of hybrid thing that I'm trying to figure out really with my role in that that show in particular. Um, that's kind of bridging between something, someone who is confident and someone who's ashamed. So. And that's also in, you're speaking about the watershed? In the right? watershed, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so before we open it up to all of you, is there anything else that you guys want to share? This is like your moment to get things off your chest. <laughs> <laughs> or just let our audience know. Okay, so you, you guys can prompt them and, yeah. And is there, do we have a mic? Okay, so the lovely Jamil has a mic. We have a question over here. Hello, um, my question is about the first two works in the show, uh, Hollowed and When the Wolves Came In. Uh, there was something, there was, they were like opposites and uh, I just wanted to know like how if that was kind of intentional to connect them at first, like what happened and I don't know, it's just something really stuck with me watching those works back to back and I'm happy that it didn't just like cut out and have like a, the lights come up. So just wanted to hear like Kyle specifically talk about those two works. Uh, sure, I think, um, so the question's about the, the choice be between putting those uh, first two works together. Um, I think for me there's a lot that I'm still kind of um, asking myself about the first piece in particular. Um, I think, oddly enough, the more I watch it, the more I think about identity. Um, there's been other conversations I've had with the company about my experience going to um, a predominantly black college, Morgan, Morgan State, for a year, and thinking that this was actually going to be a really unifying university, but it winds up being this thing where people say, oh, well, I'm from Baltimore, I'm from D.C., you know, oh, I'm from Prince George County, but they're all these neighbors that are, are these these communities that are really close to each other, but they felt like they needed to separate themselves from each other. Um, so that's something that was coming up for me in some way in the process of like uh, kind of looking at a sameness, but um, finding the looking at the difference and the sameness, all that kind of stuff was coming up for me a little bit. I think there's something about also trying to kind of hide who you are, which is really. Uh, a fixture in a lot of my solo work in particular that I was really thinking about with when the wolves came in. Um, and I think for me, thinking about the lyrical content in, in Hallowed, um, kind of praying to be changed or, or to kind of like have something changed about you, whatever that thing is, that to me is a big part of that transition from the first piece to the second piece. Um, I think many people of my generation and from my parents' generations would uh, do just that. Um, be praying to, to be changed 
in some kind of way. So I think there's something so strong about that, even though it wasn't necessarily a, a, a hymn written for um, one's sexual orientation or a lifestyle. I think there's so much that um, can be read in and kind of lived in with that in particular. Did you guys know that the end of apartheid was basically 20 years ago and it your work sort of coincides what's going on at Carnegie Hall and all that like was that put under consideration or is that just coincidental it's not coincidental <laughs> <laughs> no I, I knew those things uh, for sure um, especially with my sister who's five years older than me she um, really was, was heavily interested in apartheid so it was a topic that came up a lot in our in our household. So thinking about that, and then thinking about um, last year, even with the 150th anniversary of Emancipation Proclamation, all those things were um, big driving forces for me choosing to do this work during this residency. Um, at one point, this work was supposed to premiere earlier, um, but I was like, there's no way in the world I'd be finished by the time of, of uh, those anniversaries. So that was definitely a big um, impetus for these works. Um, no, I mean, I'm a big jazz fan, but I think um, a lot of the Roach music I'd been listening to when we were working on um, Pavement, which premiered in 2012. And uh, I actually was in Johannesburg um, for a, like a week, and I just was listening to that music, and this is my first time going there. And it just really, um, I don't know, it just oddly enough, I was already thinking about this project. So I think just something really sparked inside of me to, to kind of jump on it uh, as like the thing, my next big thing to try and jump in on and, or deal with in some way. Right over here. That was beautiful and um, just thank you very much to you all. Um, I, maybe because I'm a child of the 70s and I, came, I come from Southern Africa and I live my life now here, um, race has always been part of my life so I just found it very emotional. And I'm wondering from the dancers, especially, do you experience it emotionally each time or are you able to um, remove yourself and, and how do you do that? Because I imagine it would be just be very charged for me at least, trying to perform through that. Uh, well, <clears throat> the first time we actually, I actually got on stage, I think it was the dress rehearsal for Hallowed we got in costume and did all the lights and talked, I think Kyle talk, showed me the picture. I had a real hard time um, getting through it, just even the solo part. I mean, it's, it was part of it was being on stage by myself, telling this story or trying to communicate this without words. And I find, I find personally a lot of expression comes out of me just physically. And I've, I've talked with Winston and a couple other dancers about it just being afraid of letting myself go there emotionally because I don't really know what's gonna come out of me physically. And I don't wanna be in front of everybody looking like a fool. But you know, it's just like, I was afraid of having that moment of that ugly cry, you know, and it's just like, it's a cry that's necessary and it's real, but it's ugly and, and uncontrollable. It, I was a little, sh I'm not a little, I was very shaky into it. And, I, and then we've talked about just kind of being in that subtle, place with that piece in particular. Um, so I've had a little, I've had a journey getting there, but yeah, it's been, it's been pretty, pretty interesting going down that road and allowing myself to emotionally get there while still, you know, being physically correct. But and then I allowed myself with that to kind of tone it down and hollow it and let all my real emotions and aggressions come out in the getting, which comes after intermission and then, you know, I can come out and be really angry and anything that I wanted to scream or cry and yell in hollowed, I can now let out physically in the getting. Um, so um, each show is different for me. Um, I think I've allowed myself to almost be on the verge of tears, maybe twice. Um, and it felt good, but I felt that I shouldn't have gone that far. So I'm still working on containing myself um, and my anger, my sadness during the trio. 
and like Jeremy said in the getting, I'm really trying to just bust out and be angry and especially in the end, in the very last solo, I always get emotional and I'm not sure why as yet, but I'm still investigating. So it's a work in progress for me. Yeah, I think um, a lot of Kyle's work, uh, we do a lot of talking about the emotion and the intent. And I think in, in all of the work you have to, there's some searching about sort of what your, emo and as we run the pieces about what your emotions are and your feelings and how they can serve you or how they might also sort of hurt you from what, the, what you're trying to get across. So I, I think it's really different. You know, we all come from different backgrounds and everything. So you might have a different emotional connection to it. And as a performer, you have to identify what your personal emotion is doing to the way that you're presenting yourself. And once you can identify that bridge, you can tweak it a little bit. Like maybe your personal experience is really helping to inform this, or maybe your lack of personal experience is really frustrating and you can use that lack of personal experience. And, so there's just there's a lot of tweaking and minor adjusting I think as to how you feel personally about what's going on and how it gets informed into what you're doing so that that is communicated best serving the work and the whole group. Can I just ask maybe would it be possible to just to have everybody ask their questions so we have them all out here and then right. we'll, two people can answer them. Okay. Is that okay? That's a deal. Thanks, Jim. Uh, well, thank you for addressing the uh, piece with Robert Glasper's music and the interaction. I'm curious about the first piece. Was it, did you commission the score or was the score already existing or did you do it together? Uh, sure. The question was about the first work when the wolves came in. Uh, that music was... Um, Nico Muley uh, composed for the Los Angeles Master Chorale. And I just, it's something I actually listen to as a kind of a soundtrack when I'm reading, because we all know that New York subways are really loud. So I try and find a soundtrack to each book that I'm reading. Uh, and so a couple years ago, that was my soundtrack. Um, and I really, I was actually reading Howard's in books. So it kind of made sense to kind of tap into this when thinking about the world's history and American history. So. You something. I was interviewing and writing lately about uh, the East Western Divan of Daniel Barenboim, which deals with the, it is an orchestra composed of uh, Arabs, Palestinians, Israelis, you know, and the musicians were saying that they were very challenged, you know, in, uh, by the issue of, you know, um, uh, playing music together. And, and it brought them uh, to to play music in a better way, you know, and listen to each other. So do you think that you are going through the same kind of uh, issue? And do you think that art can really change society? Can we leave that one floating? <laughs> Sorry. Maybe we just leave that floating. It's, it's yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it, maybe, you know, Robert. As an Asian American, where you know it's always white and black, but we kind of like you know invisible. And I was curious because when you did your solo in the last piece, the graphics was whites only, blacks only, and you were kind of dancing in between. And I was curious because you grew up in Taiwan, how you, what you had, you what went through your mind about dealing with the issue, maybe that you weren't aware of or part of. So that's, I'd like to hear what, how you work that in for yourself. And then last, and we're just gonna hear the last question then we'll have okay. a couple of responses. Um, my question was, the getting is being framed sort of as a historical piece and I noticed that there's actually really very, very fresh footage of police brutality, a man who was recently killed by the NYPD. And I'm wondering if that was something that was conceived, sort of put into the work because this event had happened while this was being developed, or if that was something that you've always sort of wanted to bring into the piece, sort of the, the merging of the present, present reality of police brutality. So maybe we'll start on the end, then go to you, Robert, and then come back here. Hello? <laughs> so I, yeah, I, um, um, 
um, the pictures that um, Kyle that put um, backstage, that definitely helps me. Um, there are a couple of them that just by looking at them just breaks my heart. Um, and that can, that already have some um, emotional um, effect on me. And also um, I'm always thinking about when um, back in the day in Taiwan, when people are um, striving for uh, freedom, democracy, um, and people are not being treated um, equally, um, and also male, um, male and female, um, yeah. I guess translating the compositions, the historical references, and how how we translate or how hard it is for us to translate. <clears throat> but it's not hard for us to translate this music because you know we just got free, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> it's not like history, really. It's you know my mother was in the segregated, you know, couldn't go to the same bathroom, you know, so. You know, it's not something that's far away, you know what I mean? Um, I grew up in Texas, so. Um, <laughs> there you have it. Um, the very people who implemented these, some of these laws are, who are, who are, you know, uh, my whole thing is, you know, the laws change, but people didn't change. You know what I mean? So when people say, oh, racism is dead. No, it's not, they're still alive. The people who didn't, you know, allow us to do these things because we were not human or whatever they thought we were, you know, they're still here, you know what I mean? This was not long ago, you know what I mean? So just because the laws change, it's like, all right, y'all can go to the same bathroom, does not mean that the hatred is not still in people's hearts and, the, you know, just still there. Um, so that is, is with us now, it's happening now, you know? Happened yesterday, you know what I mean? That's why we have footage of, fresh footage, because now the only difference is we have camera phones to prove it, you know what I mean? But this is nothing new. And so when, when it's time for us to translate this, it's not hard at all, because this is literally something we're going through. Obviously, I didn't go through it as like my grandmother did, or you know, I'm not being hosed or anything like that, but you know, it's still here, you know, and and so, you know, I've talked to my grandmother about racism. I've talked to my dad. I've talked to my mother. You know what I mean? So it's still home for us. So it's not hard at all. It's a part of our story that we're still fighting to get through, you know? So it's easy. I think, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Where's Jamil? Where are we? Where are we? Yeah, we're done, actually. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just say thank you. I think um, if people have additional questions, we can answer them in the lobby. Um, and to your question about uh, the, the images in the in the film, I knew that I was going to use something contemporary. I just wasn't sure what it was going to be because there's so many things that remind that uh, when I hear the scream that um, that Charnay's doing um, in reference to the Abby Lincoln kind of guttural moment. It was th about the frustrations that still exist today, and even hear Robert say that we're not being hosed today. Just you know, not even like a month ago, a newscaster is saying, "Well, you know, what about hoses?" You know, so it's it's really ridiculous. It's it's uh, that tension's still there. My anger is still there from my parents and from their parents and from their parents. So there's a lot more to be done and to be said. Hopefully, we can do some of that in the lobby, y'all. Yes. <laughs>